But on to tonight's event. Uh, for each literature festival uh, that we have run so far, we have had an event with two upcoming award-winning stellar British poets, and tonight is no exception. Uh, they join a list of poets that includes Andrew McMillan, Martina Evans, Keith Jarrett, Jane Yeh, Siobhan Campbell, Luke Kennard and Mary Jean Chan. So tonight we are very, very proud to be bringing you the poetic talents of Sophia Blackwell and John McCulloch. Uh, John and Sophia will each read for about 22, 23 minutes uh, and then we will take questions from you all at the end of the session. Uh, if you want to be typing your questions into the chat facility in Zoom as we go along, me and Caroline will be keeping an eye on those. And as best as we are able, as we all wrestle with this wonderful technology, we will turn your microphone on so you can ask your question in person at the end of the event. Uh, but let me start by introducing Sophia. Uh, bear with me while I find my notes. I have about 71 screens open. Uh, Sophia is a performance poet with three published collections of poetry and the author of a novel. Her poetry has been anthologized by Blood Axe, Nine Arches and the Emma Press, amongst others. And for the past year, she's hosted the LGBT plus radio show out in South London on Resonance FM. Recent notable gigs have included four appearances at Glastonbury on the Poetry and Word stage, Women of the, Women of the World Festival at the South Bank and headlining a national tour with Hammer and Tongue. She is a literary, literary deathmatch champion, which I'm taking as a warning before the evening kicks off, a spread the word LGBT hero and a diversity role model, as well as being a freelance editor, chair of Poetry London and the Pride Network at Hatchet UK, or Hatchet UK, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, for each of tonight's uh, poets, I have stumbled across a lovely testimonial from another great writer, uh, both of both the testimonials have come from yet more people that we've been proud to host in the past. Uh, so this is from the wonderful writer Stella Duffy, who has said, some of Sophia's poems read like Nico should be singing them to John Cale's viola. Some as if Shakespeare's slut sister taught him all he knew. Others are as new as the new dawn. Dirty, juicy, knowing and open. It works for me. Uh, I think that works for us too. So let me hand over to Sophia Blackwell. Hello, uh, lovely to see you all. Oh, cat, mute clapping, love it. You discover something new every day. Anyways, that was the uh, blurb of, that is on, on, on my website for uh, basically trying to encourage people to give me more gigs. And I'm uh, really, really delighted to be here tonight. I've been looking forward to it for weeks and enjoying the correspondence in the run-up. So lovely to see you all. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of pieces from my latest collection, The Other Woman. Um, you probably won't be able to see on the book cover, but it has me and uh, Mrs. Blackwell uh, doing a sort of tipping the velvet uh, gentleman Jack mashup sort of pose. And there's a lot of different ways of, of being the other woman in the book. There's being the other woman in someone else's relationship, or there's having another woman in your relationship, or any kind of things like that. But this other woman that I'm going to start the uh, set with is not that. This is basically just a mean spirited poem about the people who my exes date after me because they are never anything like me. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, they're just really different. So this is the other woman. She owns a fleece and knows the names of trees. She understands Bitcoin, blockchain and chess. Her male friends do not think of her that way. The other woman isn't much like me. The other woman gets from A to B. She chairs committees, tweets at companies. I send an emailed grievance privately. That other woman's really not like me. She studied at Life's University. She sees no need for fiction, hip hop, lipstick. People don't find her threatening at parties. Your friends all say she suits you more than me. Your parents tolerate her grudgingly. You never stuffed her past in frayed bin bags that split and spilled. She owns apparently some property. Well, you'll never have to look for her in me. You've got a ring now and a front door key. And me, I'm good. In fact, I'm moving closer towards the woman I'd have been without you, with everything you caged in me set free. Sometimes I wonder when she'll start to doubt you. And that's one thing you'll have to share with me. 
The next poem that I'm going to do is, it's um, the four year anniversary of mine and my wife's wedding tomorrow. And um, it feels sort of ironic that I've kicked her out of the room uh, in order to do loads of poems about how much I love her. It feels like when you see people like, on Instagram going, oh my God, me and the hubby, hashtag so blessed. And then they go onto another platform and slag off their husbands. Like, I feel like that woman, I, I banned her from, from where I currently am. Um, but we, we do have some pictures. So behind me, you can see some of uh, family portraits, not particularly well, but there's a wedding photo there and there's a picture of my grandparents um, from the Italy and Ireland respectively and uh, there's a picture of Helena's mum who came over just after the uh, the Windrush um, and this poem Migrations is about, it's about being married, um, doing as many about love as possible tonight and it's also about how your partner can completely exasperate you because my wife has a habit of walking down the street whenever we're in a foreign country looking for landmarks through the medium of her phone when they're actually directly in front of her and, and that, that's where this poem begins it's called migrations and it's the uh i think it's the first collect first book um first book first poem in the newish collection better go on with writing another one really if 2018 is newish but it's been a lot on this year I lost it in the 10th arrondissement one rainy day when you refused to see or look up from your phone or back at me across the street your longed for restaurant, the one place in Paris that cooked like Hoxton. It seems our answer to thickening borders and passport glaring guards with armoured shoulders is to make the world our own private London, way up the charms of Spain and San Francisco in rooftop bars. You boot up your computer, seeking solutions, troubleshooting risks. Truth is, every marriage has its own future and its own laws. A thin certificate renders skin and gender a non-issue for us, for now. Our anthem is your breastbone against my ear. Our histories twist with anger, but we know you can't make a meal of hunger, and all our ancestors' turbulent crossings have come to rest in us coins sewn in hems, your sepia mother in tan leather gloves, all chapters in a book that ends with love, our friends, olive-skinned kids honouring them at our table, the wind rush in you, the golden door in me is all there, so let the wanderers come from war to the port, staggering up the shore to find what we find, London, Madrid, Rome, and me in the middle, tugging your coat once more, asking you, are we not already home? Thank you. This next one I'm going to do is from my earlier collection, which is called The Fire Eater's Lover. I don't know if it's, it's all like, I'm my, this is my latest collection. So I feel as though they should have comedic titles. I ventured out of the house to see uh, what one of my favorite poets, Barbara Brownskirt, a poet of the people recently. And it, it is just, I, I can't take my own titles seriously after seeing Barbara, I, I don't know why. Anyway, so The Fire Eater's Lover is, is my second collection. And this is a longer, slightly more performancey poem from that. Um, basically, I miss my city, even though I, I live in it. London is not itself. Um, it's hard to know what it's going to be like when, when we emerge. Um, and this poem was written a few years ago in Golden Square in Soho, as I was watching the world go by in all its multiple London strangenesses. It's called London Prayer. And I feel it now more than, than I ever have. London, take care of your wounded chatting in toilets and bus queues to anyone who couldn't stop talking even if you paid them, even if you held them every night till dawn. Their voices like music they couldn't turn off so if they stopped for a moment they'd think they were deaf. Help them. London, give them what they seek. The awkward age girls who haven't quite realised and still think they're flat-chested kids. The old ladies wilting and peeling like heat addled tulips. The clean again rock stars with crack chiseled cheekbones. The ballet shoe women with gobstopper pearls don't turn away. London, please preserve them. The sleepless researchers and feral PR girls. The starlets in track pants, perhaps eating a sandwich. The lads dressed as preppies, the rich girls like strippers. The Hoxton finned posh boys who DJ on Thursdays. The short shortage cats in Dickensian and flat caps try not to laugh. London, be nice to them sometimes. Even the wankers, estate agents, landlords, amateur mystics and fanny pack travellers who stand still as salt cellars clogging street corners, 
pray for the buskers with diamond guitars and checks dropping CVs behind so her bars give them a break. London, don't let them fall too far. The jeweled skulls, the runners, the gum chewers, can sniffers, founders of companies named after buzzwords, ticket touts, Jesus freaks, trainee baristas, teenage boy tourists with shoulder slung sweaters, fly posters, label hounds, cleaners, protesters, keep your eyes on them as they pass through. Him. And London, because I am one or more or all of these things, help me too. Thank you. Another place poem here with a very different kind of tone to it. This one is for my uh, co-reader tonight, Mr. John McCulloch, um, because it's set in, in Brighton, where John has set some of his wonderful poems. And this is basically about just, you know, there's not much fun going on in the world at the moment. And sometimes like life, even normal life or whatever that is, can get in the way of you having the kind of fun with your mates that you used to have when you were young and uh, able to do shots still. And so this poem is called Brighton and it's about wanting to spend some time uh, with your girlfriends, especially once you know, you're know you married or you have kids or whatever, and you just, you never get to go and do anything stupid. Darling, I've got a plan. Let's go to Brighton. We need some girl time in the C-sharp air, tip fat and rain like perfume in our hair. You've been not wearing colors for too long. Let's set the clocks rattling back like wheels out of Victoria. Let's light up vogues like wide-eyed students with new minted loans we think we won't pay back. Let's go to Brighton and dance on bars, a pair of Larry aunties wearing earrings you could fit a fist through, latex and glitter. Let's laugh like we used to, let's chicken out of getting tattoos. Let's sleep off hangovers in the faded roses of B&Bs, hit the pleasure domes, buy two pink pails for gathering up the stones, sit, half cut in the dark. Hear the sea groan in front of us, it's old unending blues rolling over email, traffic, tubes, husbands and lovers, everything we do that gets between us being me and you. But growing up isn't all bad and uh, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that the things that are really important, the life lessons that stay with you can actually be about some of the most inconsequential things. So this poem is the, basically it's the sum total uh, but all the wisdom that I've learned in all my 30 something, I'm not going to tell you how many something years on this earth, and it's called How You Learn. I hope you find this advice useful. It's put me in good stead over the years. Who's the second cheapest booze? It's probably less rough. Lipstick that's not red is not working hard enough. Add a little water when your onions start to burn. You know, you think of her when you do that, but this is how you learn. Dress code in the Middle East, the Arabic for book. Eyes or lips, not both, though you like a bolder look. Anything can shift and change, everything can turn. Never date a mama's boy or girl, this is how you learn. Try not to act too try hard while eating somewhere glam. Tap water, please, the wine is fine, you think you'll have the lamb. When you're making coffee, see at the bottom of the urn, you know a guy I hated taught me that, but this is how you learn. Rinse your hair in icy water, you are not a dancer. God is in the house, but she doesn't always answer. Keep on moving forward when you know you can't return. This journey is the only one, and this is how you learn. Thank you. This next one I'm going to do is basically, you know, writers, um, thank you for the lovely applause, I love seeing those little Pac-Men creatures in the corner. Um, this one is about when somebody dumps you and says, well, it's okay because you can use it as material. It also includes two sets of pronouns, male and female, because I had an uh, affair with a guy. Um, it was, you know, it was kind of out of character for me because I'm a complete lesbian, but it was lovely and I got a novel out of it. So, it, you know, it wasn't all bad. Um, and he appears in this poem as well. But yeah, this is basically like, if you're dating an artist, please don't tell them they can use it. It's probably, you know, they probably will anyway. They actually don't need your permission. Um, this is also one of the, I mean, to be honest, I try and put content warnings on any of my poems that may be perceived as disturbing just because of that's how things are these days. Um, when somebody shared this on Twitter, I got sort of told off for um, a scene about metaphorical and animal abuse. It's not animal abuse, it's a metaphorical animal. And I've been a vegetarian since 1995. I just think you need to know that. This is called Material. You can use this, she said, avoiding my eyes. You'll thank me when you're famous. I pushed my keys back through the door. They say it's all material, but what she left me with was a sickly animal. I took it round the back and slashed its throat. I thought at my feet, blood, Christ, now what? 
I sheathed myself and its pelt up to the neck, belted to stop my ribs flying apart. Its heart lobbed to the strays, I picked my teeth with bones, gorged on my lungs until my belly groaned, licked the bowl and boiled the bones for glue. You know, people still ask me where I got this coat. You can use this he said one of these days. You know, imagine a romance with us as the lead. And we laughed like crazy till we shook the bed, but I did, love, I'm sorry, I did. I snipped a black lock from his sleeping head, thumbed it into a pot and sang to the dirt and a tree grew that cracked the town's foundations, roots swooping into oligarchs' basements. Lovers brought picnics, dreamed in its wide shade and girls we'd never dare to talk to, discuss lust, breathlessly citing us, it's for the best, he said. I smiled for the press across town as plants died. They said I was strong. I was an old soul, a big girl, whole life ahead, but that is no one's doing but mine. I'm older now, I've walked behind the dead and they said I wouldn't remember, but I did. They said, you can use this, and I did. I did. Don't you worry, your pretty heads. I did. Thank you. I always have so much fun do doing that one. Um, I also have fun doing, doing the next two. So this poem is anthologized um, by, by Blood Axe, which is one of my proudest achievements because I love Blood Axe so much as a house. It's from uh, the, the Northeast where I grew up. I know you can't tell from the accent. And basically it's about getting a dress at a thrift shop that gives you an inferiority complex because the dress is so good. And what's under it, maybe a bit less so, it's, it's called vintage. Saturday's dress was someone else's bones that it might have stood up on its own. I wished I might have known its previous owner, not just a London wife who had outgrown the kind of life that needs a scarlet dress, but a starlet, rubbing ice cubes on her breasts to keep them pert. She'd sleep cocooned in corsets. She'd be that broad who walks into his office one drink-fogged Monday, something on her mind, fur lapped with trembling lips or a barefoot bride that skipped town, thumb trucks down on neon strips. Praying, I tugged the zip and stepped inside another woman's skin, as if her sweat had stiffened the seams like a salt-rimmed glass. And I was hit, an hourglass hips and ass, a viciously nipped waist all as delicious as a lover's embrace. Of course, it kept its shape later as I stepped out of it. In the rude shock of nipples and dark cloud of hair, no underwear, I walked like treading water warily to bed, my skin's pale luster somehow more flawed, news as a shocked oyster. This next poem I'm going to do, I always have fun doing this one as well. And um, this is my basically, I don't know where my next gig is coming from. I know where my next radio shows are coming from. They're every Tuesday at 6.30 on Resonance FM. And sometimes I do spoken word on those as well. But next gig, no idea. So basically, this is the, this is the highlights reel. I love doing this one. Because again, it's a stupid poem about my ex or one of my exes, there's quite a few. Um, and um, them basically being passive aggressive about me in a social media format. So I can't imagine this happening. It doesn't obviously still happen to me on the regular at all. It's called Nearly Wed. You said you nearly married me. That's really not a thing. I must admit it worried me. Like what would nearly married be? A cake crumb of eternity? The imprint of a ring. No silver paper invitation signed and sealed sincerely. No debating the location and in fact no conversation came before your declaration. You'd have asked me nearly. You always thought there was another though I loved you dearly. But with so much to be discovered could we forego former lovers only us beneath your covers shun or others? Nearly. When things are manifestly sour, it's simplest to get rid. Some lady poets spend their hours composing in their nearly bowers, like Wendy Cope, whose nearly flowers have made her a few quid. But me, I take things literally. And I loved you still, deliberately, for everything you did for me, not what you nearly did. Thank you. The next two that I'm going to do are about, I don't, I, know, I never want to say the phrase like my current relationship, you know, like when somebody introduces you to my current girlfriend and you just think, that's not a good sign, is it? My, yeah, my relationship, the only one I'm ever bothering with, basically. If, 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 that's it, I'm just, yeah, just 
cats is, is the way forward. But you know, ma marriage it can, can be lovely, and that's what the, these next two poems are, are about. Um, I had some uh, some help with this one from uh, my friend Alan Buckley, whose whose poems some of you may have read. Um, Alan is, is one of my favourite people, and when I asked him to do a critique of the manuscript. Um, you know, he takes things very seriously, like me. Um, so he said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it for, for one poem. And he chose this one. This is about being in Amsterdam. I love, quite a few of my poems tonight have been about being somewhere else, um, apart from the UK. Can't imagine why. Um, and this is about be, being in Amsterdam and, um, yeah, the ease and the difficulties of being in love. Easy enough to leave a hotel room on a blue morning, the air crushed diamonds, a slanted note propped on the sheets. Back soon. Easy to be in love in Amsterdam, in trainers and fake fur. The doorman's wink gives the nod to everything I am, while last night's flat champagne chills in the sink. Easy to stride across museum square for 10 euro roses, red laced with ink in plastic tails. You'd think love would be harder on a damp Tuesday megabus to Bristol in two narrow beds at an airport hotel, or at a funeral two days before Christmas. But in truth, those days never made me any less grateful for you, or any less in love. And here I am, in my thirties, someone's wife, mad hair, no makeup, brushing toward midlife, bearing my dripping flowers, nothing to prove. So that's a bit of an anniversary poem. I've got two more, which I'm gonna do. It's kind of funny, like, you know, I've been gigging since I was 21 and the old habits don't change. I'm currently looking at the clock and going, yeah, for some reason, I still know how many poems 22 minutes takes up. You know, still got it, never left me. Um, this poem's about Christmas because it'll probably be here tomorrow um, at the rate things are going. I've lost three months already this year. Um, and it's based on, there are many poems inspired by John Donne's um, A Nocturnal on, on St. Lucy's Day. And Joe Bell's also written a poem called Things That Are, which is an, an inspiration for, for this. Um, hers is a bit more about sex. Um, it's a lovely poem, do, do read it. Um, and this, for me, is slightly more about the meditative moments that you get um, during your holidays. And that this was kind of when those moments were a rarity rather than what things are just like at the moment. It's called Solstice. For lovers, every day is the shortest day. But when we wake and see the winter's laid its frost bleached light across our waiting bed, I reach for your elbow, ask you to stay right where you are. We'll watch the garden glow, one sugared apple in a hat of snow. Our tree preens like a wise man in the kitchen. Today we'll leave a cardboard door ajar on something good, an angel or a star. Gold candle ends are guttering and twitching, but this dried out year, drawing to a close, makes a dead sunflower head a Christmas rose. Let's not snip ribbon ends or burnish pastries. Tick off lists, keep chasing the tales of our lives, for we know are the ways to be good wives. This whole slovenly day ours for the tasting. When the year's stopped clock beckons you to love, may God grant us the wisdom not to move. Put on the CD from a long dead friend. It's carols twisting silver filaments of holly crowns and slaughtered innocence. This is the time for watching things end. One frozen heel of bread, two stunted eggs. The coffee pot spits out the year's dark dregs, gather them up, bring them back to bed. Let's have it all now, brilliantly clear. The miracle of what's already here. Let's let the words stay on our tongues unsaid. The world will be back with us soon enough. The year's deep night and the morning of us. Thank you. I've just got one more, and um, this is from the previous book, The Fire Eater's Lover. Um, this one never gets old. Um, I, it's, it's sad that it never gets old. Um, I've got a couple of, you know, mutedly angry ones, and I, I was sort of thinking about which ones to do. Um, obviously, there's a lot of frustration at the moment. This was written in, originally in 2016 in the aftermath of some police violence in, in the US. Um, and every year or indeed every month, there seems to be something else to relate it to. But don't give up hope. Um, I have seen this shared online in, in difficult moments. So I hope it's useful for you too. And do hit me up on Twitter afterwards if you want to see a copy of it and if it might help. Uh, this is the last one that I'm going to do. It's short. Um, and it's called Lucent. 
sleepwalking through relentless gas lamp grey, breathless voices clamouring of rage and nothing letting up, the papers braying five more years of this, the headline savage. You realise anger is not hot, but cold and lasts. People are praying, hands clamped to their chests in dark streets. Sing for the ones they mourn, welcome them home, watch the blue flames lick upward like unheard prayers as you prepare the supper, hearing your lover pottering in the bathroom. Your grief is smart, it will not burn the house down, not yet. A candle, a sneak cigarette can be a blazing church for you tonight. Nobody's going to tell you it's all right. Into this dark, send out your stubborn light. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was my set. Um, really, you know, really lovely to see you all. And thank you for keeping your cameras on. Those of you who are able to, thank you for letting me see your facial expressions. It makes such a huge difference. And uh, I will now uh, mute myself and hand back to Dave. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, lots of flashbacks to moments in my life listening to you talking about yours as well. Yes, I've yes I've had those mornings in Amsterdam. <laughs> there's a there's a photo of me from many years ago, uh, leaning over one of the the canal bridges that somebody took from a boat uh, going underneath. And as they said, in the wrong light, you look amazingly like Patty Smith, Dave. And I've never quite worked out how to take that one. <laughs> so. But lovely to have given you a gig, Sophia, and we hope you get many more soon. Uh, so let me move on to our second poet of the evening. Uh, and uh, let me introduce John McCulloch. Uh, I'll read you a brief bio. Uh, when John is not writing, he teaches creative writing courses at the University of Brighton, the Alban Foundation and at New Writing South. He has a PhD in English Literature from the University of Sussex after writing a thesis on the Rhetoric of Friendship in Renaissance Writing, 1579 to 1625. So I think you're up for a, for a, a clear specialist round on Mastermind at some point, John. Uh, his interests include queer culture, Doctor Who, and most things to do with Japan. He grew up in Watford, but now lives in Hove with his partner Morgan Case and our cats. And like Sophia, I've, I've found a, a lovely testimonial about John's writing from yet another former Milton Keynes lit first writer, which is Adam Mars Jones, uh, who said of John's writing, John's poems are never far from wonderful. He shows a lovely mixture of ease and energy, so that there's a feeling of improvisation even in closed forms. Unpredictable, tender, resourceful. Why shouldn't Wallace Stevens hold hands with Tintin? To which I can only say, why indeed? Uh, and I shall hand over to John. John McCulloch, the stage is yours. <clears throat> Hi there, <laughs> thank you for having me, thank you so much for pairing me up again with Sophia who's one of my favourite writers and who's always been so so generous, Sophia has a really big heart and has always been so lovely and kind um, to me when I was making my way in the London poetry world so I was really um, flattered to be invited both to perform at MK Lit Fest but also especially with um, Sophia um, I'm going to read to you some poems this evening from a book called Reckless Paper Birds, which you might have heard of. Um, <laughs> oh, that's what I like to see. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to read some poems from that mostly. And um, yeah, this first one emerged from the seed of a phrase that had been in my notebooks knocking around for many years. Um, often, I, um, a, a sentence or a, a line will come to me and um, I won't know what to do with it until um, many years later and this poem um, is one of the ones that um, emerged from something which had just been circling my brain for a long time. The first line of this poem arrived many years before the rest of it. Soulcraft. It's true. There is a light at the centre of my body. If I could, I would lift aside a curtain of this flesh and demonstrate. But for now, it is my private neon. It is closer to the air at certain moments. 
like when buttercups repair a morning's jagged end. Other times, a flock of days descends, and my soul flickers, goes to ground. Without light, I'm all membrane. Each part becomes a gate. I pour across each margin, and nothing has enough hands to catch me. My teeth knocking so fast, I don't hold any piece of myself near in case I start a banquet. I'm only eased by accident. On the drenched path, I pick up snails and transport them to safer earth, then feel a stirring. I watch as rain streams from locked back elms, my face teeming with water and, hello stranger, my soul glides to my surface like it too belongs there like a bright fish rising to feed. Yes, the unusual thing, thank you. The unusual thing about Brighton is we do still have lots of elms here um, in all the parks. I wasn't aware of how strange that is until, um, yeah, someone said to me, um, oh, why are there all these elms in your poems? <laughs> yeah, they exist, they're still here. This next poem, um, it's tomorrow, I think, National Poetry Day, isn't it? Thursday, yeah, and this poem was commissioned by the BBC for National Poetry Day um, a while back. It was added to the book at the very last moment. Um, I don't know how Sophia feels about commissioned poems. I sometimes kind of <laughs> get sent into a blind panic by um, organisations like the BBC or British Film Institute or whoever asking me to do these poems. And um, the BBC in particular, as a public service broadcaster, has to fulfill lots of criteria so you have to jump through lots of hoops so I was asked to produce a poem that was 60 seconds in length on the theme of change um, that was non-political non-controversial that referenced various local place names local flora local fauna included um, local language and didn't contain brand names a long list of hoops I had to jump through with this poem and when I'd finished writing it I actually um, I didn't want to see ever again and then I was only my editor um, Tom Chivers and a friend of mine in Brighton who tag teamed me and got it into the book so I, was, I didn't actually want to put it in the book originally because it would have been a slightly traumatic commission but um, in the end they both liked it and they kind of it ended up it, weirdly it's the first poem in the book but um, it got added at the last minute and then it got shoved to the front at the last minute um, but yeah, I like it more now. I've, I've grown to love this poem because purely in a shallow way because other people have liked it. I've kind of like, my own child has finally had some attention from its parent, <laughs> the poor thing. <laughs> it's called The Zigzag Path. The day connives and you think you cannot live here in your body, alone and rushing forward all the time like a silty river. All you wanted was to find a home beside the souls of white roses and hurt no one. But the light keeps shifting. An invisible broom keeps flicking you out from cover. You roll up at each destination with a different face, as wrong as the beech tree in Preston Park hung with trainers. A museum of tongues. The day connives, but this dirt is proof of trying. The chalk path you never longed for, zigzags through cowslips no one asked to throng. In the park, a robin has built its nest inside a rebok. The shoe's throat packed with moss and a crooked whisper of grass that says, I can. I can, I can. Yeah, initially I wasn't allowed to have Reebok. It was trainers only <laughs> on the highway with the BBC. And I was like, no, I'm putting in Reebok. I love trainers. I'm a sneakerhead. This next poem is the only one I'm going to read this evening that's not taken from Leckless Paper Birds. I felt I wanted to read one of the more recent ones. I've been working on a manuscript this year, which is all about anxiety and mental health. And um, inevitably, that was begun long before the 
coronavirus pandemic, it's been shaped by the widespread social anxiety uh, created by our recent circumstances. Uh, my poems about um, the politics of COVID, I've generally kind of posted up on social media rather than going through the usual route of magazines, just because, um, yeah, they're poems of the moment and I want to kind of get them out there now rather than kind of waiting six months to hear back from a magazine, as is sometimes the case. But yeah, this poem was inspired by that. And I've always been fascinated by bioluminescent animals like plankton. Some species of plankton um, glow this gorgeous blue colour um, and you sometimes get them um, washing up at shore uh, locally in Sussex. But what I was really interested to find when I researched the issue was that um, I read this thing by a biologist that says, though we find um, these shimmering plankton to be very beautiful, um, it's actually caused by a panic response and the plankton are terrified because they're lost and they're very far from their natural environment which is far out at sea so be washing up on a shore is very frightening for them and they are just and um, they are desperate and they're trying to sh to shine light on any potential predators that might have been trying to trap them in some way and i found it interesting that fusion of something that we find beautiful that is actually um emergent from terror and so this beauty, this beauty, this poem is all about, I suppose, holding beauty and terror together in circumstances of um, fear that we currently find ourselves in. It's called And. The radiance is visiting again. A bloom of shimmering plankton at low tide. Blue songs that lift the shore to space. Conditions must be perfect for them to glow. The darkness total. They must be far from home, completely lost, exiled by currents, then panicked by the foamy smack of breakers. This is no bounty for them. It's horror, this brilliance that quivers, arcs. Picture it now so you'll remember the image one lonely midnight when your heart assaults your ribs. The galactic light of tiny selves that never wanted anything like this, but together finished up terrified, magnificent, brightly living the only way they know. I'm going to return to Reckless Paper Birds uh, for this next poem, um, which emerged. Um, I grew up in quite a working class area of um, Watford, and I didn't come out as queer until I'd moved long um, until long afterwards. I'd moved away um, several times, and um, yeah, it just wasn't really. I didn't. It didn't feel possible to be queer in the in the place that I grew up in, and um, I've kind of reflected on that more as I've um, grown older. And this poem takes that and it fuses it also with um, one time I was given a counterfeit coin in my change and I did that thing of like kind of trying to get rid of it first of all in kind of like spot machines and other places um, and then eventually I kind of grew to identify um, with it and the notion of being um, counterfeit and um, in some way um, illicit and, and undermining currency. Queer coal. You tumbled into my palm in a trickle of sterling. Bad coin, foul queen, though I didn't notice. I pocketed you, conveyed you like your sedan chair, respectfully slotted you into vending machines that coughed you out. You winked at me from a change tray and abruptly I spotted everything about you was wrong. Your weight, your ill-defined milled edge, your obverse skewed, not copper, zinc, nickel, but lead, sprayed with gold paint, too shiny. Queer coal, they used to say, meaning counterfeit or base money. What ends up improperly beside your person, tilting the system, forcing each wall, mutilating the weather. 
fucking queer. A voice in the Watford crowd snarled as my lips brushed Ryan's cheek. There I was, my mouth mimicking legit. My hoodie, cap, trackies like a man's, but on close inspection, awry. My voice too light, edges blurred, flickery. I carry this awareness in my blood. How simply I'm revealed as undermining the currency, warping the ceiling. Now coin, I keep you squirreled in my wallet's secret section. You are my talisman. Return me to what I am. No pink pound, but queer coal. Rebel head, wonky origin, dangerous minting. This next poem is one of the first um, poems I wrote exploring um, origami and it's what led to the book eventually having the title that it did, Reckless Paper Birds. Uh, my other half, Morgan, who's in the other room, uh, is actually a bit of an origami whiz. Most of the stuff you see me posing with on Facebook, like a game show hostess, has actually been constructed by him rather than me. So um, yes, I should give um, credit where it's due. Uh, this poem contains some mild filth at the end, so don't be disappointed that it's not full on filth, but there is a quantity of filth there. So don't, no clutching at pearls. Um, yes, I grew up, I should say, also in Watford, and I went to an evangelical church during my uh, childhood. And believe it or not, I was in the choir. I went to Sunday school every Sunday, and I used to sing in the church choir. And um, yeah, when I eventually um, decided that I was going down a different path in life, um, it led to me kind of having a difficult relationship with that earlier part of my life. Flock of paper birds. I needed the God of my childhood to be useful. So I folded him, shaped his pages into wings. Cranes at first, then more challenging roosters, swallows, owls. I pinched edges split clauses to make word plumage. I fractured Leviticus with pleats. Now toucans mount doves on the kitchen counter near an unholy pile of geese. Cloacas gaping, beaks jabbing everywhere. Birds plummet from shelves without bothering to flap. Remember nothing. Ink blurs, feathers yellow. They drown in baths, rip luridly, turn up mangled in the hallway, footprints across their necks. Mostly, they're individuals, smoothly indifferent to each other's fates. Though now and then, some prop up neighbours if they topple. And when I lie with a visitor beneath my quilt, incubating his glorious buttocks, the flock discover their throats and sing together while I guide my tongue along warm creases and the tight sheet of his body unfolds. <laughs> Somehow I find that person easy, that poem easier to read out on Zoom than in person with the really filthy stuff in this book. Like I'm always like, oh, can I say that? I read that poem out at Ledbury Poetry Festival when they weren't expecting it. And there were, the crowd, they were just gasping and it was just really kind of, I just went really red. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God. I've just taken my whole perverted juggernaut and driven it through Ledbury Poetry Festival. <laughs> so I'm gonna to read to you um, three more poems, I think. And this next one is one of the poems that kind of set up the where I was gonna go next, really. I've always suffered from anxiety and um, from, um, yeah, um, mental health problems that have arisen through um, panic. And I wanted to write about it in a way, the next, I have written some things about it which are darker. This one is, the last three poems I wanted to have, I wanted to end on a lighter note, and this is one of them. My mum used to work in a toy shop and there was a big Playmobil figure that I always used to walk past on the way to see my mum and round its head had a sign, please don't touch me, my head falls off. 
which is another one of those phrases that I scribbled down and was just hanging around in my notebooks for many years before I finally found a home for it in a poem. And I often say this to my students that not all of the language that you use in a poem has to be completely new and created that week for that poem. Often I go back to phrases that I've been um, kind of struggling with for years and years and not knowing what to do with and then suddenly they just find a home. Please don't touch me. My head falls off. Reads the sign around the neck of the enormous Playmobil figure. I know the feeling. I blame Red Bull and I blame the news. In tests, 70% of humans can be persuaded to give an electric shock to a stranger. I'd rather give them shortbread or perhaps a little wave, but those two could have blue consequences. I scan the crowd and wonder who might push the button. This student in brogues, wielding lilies. The yummy mummy with a fearsome ponytail. I'm not answering further questions till my solicitor is present or I have proof they are irrevocably bad. Like at that fancy dress party when I saw a cyberman smoke a cigarette. Meanwhile, I'm petrified at the thump in my chest that is four valves closing that conjures up a backwards advent calendar, a door shut with every year. I tremble, pick up falafel wraps and store each terror like those bald eagles who save every twig they find till their overburdened nests plummet to the ground. I drop my leftover wrap in a bin and consider death by falling or electrocution, death by milk float, steered by the nemesis I didn't know I had. I am vastly misjudged as a foe I want to tell him. He doesn't know who he's dealing with, how much I'm not here. Startled as I am by what turns out to be moss tumbling from gutters, by the voice shrieking and howling in my pocket that is Kate Bush, by a horde of breakable creatures not licking or hitting each other just treading their way softly along the back of morning, tiny hearts jolting. Thank you. The last two poems I'm going to read to you are love poems. And this next one um, has a prop. And see, see, one of the benefits of being on, on Zoom is that I can show you random paraphernalia from my house, which I'm going to do now. Here is the teapot that poured out a poem for me. I love teapots. <laughs> if I could, I would fill up my whole flat with them. I love them. They are just so friendly and maternal and kind of um, reassuring in some way. And um, my partner and I decided we really wanted a yellow teapot at one stage. And not that we're gay or anything, but like, yeah, we decided we really needed a yellow teapot. And we tracked down this particular one and its cheery presence um, enlivens my days. And it, even better than that, it pulled out a poem for which I'm inc always incredibly grateful. And Sophia said, if you get a poem out of it, almost anything is worth it in the end. <laughs> Spout. Some months, all my thoughts are one colour. I hit a yellow mood and the world pours out its yokes. Tall stacks of National Geographic in Oxfam. Cranes that point uncertain fingers at the sky while maple leaves swoop into me and cling. Their veins like roads heading everywhere in fallen saffron cities. Then the teapot you saw on eBay had to have. It was like unpacking October and standing it on our table. Its yellow logic strict yet plump, offering an outsized handle. A colour that might foster never-ending cups. We filled it with boiling water, our new sun. And that first time, the copper rings around its centre made it tick, tick, tick. As if letting us know it could wipe us out if it wanted to. But we'd been spared. That we could live beside it, though should be grateful for everything of its kind which travelled toward us. All the yellow days.
Thank you. I'm going to read you one last poem. And it's my favourite poem in the book, um, which is stationary. And it's a September poem, so it's very appropriate for now. Um, not this year, but in every other September for the last 15 years, I've spent a lot of time going shopping for stationery. I'm an uh, academic for my day job in the sense of teaching classes on creative writing. So it's very uh, necessary for me to have um, multiple highlighters in every shade and various exciting colours of binder and um, yeah, various coloured biros, um, marker pens, chalks, everything needs to be in every colour. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I love September for that reason. It's kind of like um, a fun time still, I usually, for me. And I wanted to write a love poem, an anxious love poem, as I held Beauty and, together, Beauty and Terror together earlier. This poem kind of holds together um, love and panic, really. So it's a love poem that is set in September, and um, that's probably about all you need to know, really. But yeah, it's my last one for this evening. Thank you for listening to me. Stationary. September is going all out to ease us in. The crowded sky is a whiteboard for helpful diagrams. The first cool air as welcome as your hand inside my jeans. Autumn zips round with its orange highlighter and you provide nifty shocks and marshmallows, leaving pornographic post-its that ask me to rendezvous, please, for hot chocolate. I'm the type of man who likes unnecessary displays of manners, who appreciates thank you cards, warning signs, a forest of regretful notices for building works. I admire rows of ginkgos that lose all their foliage in one drop to form a yellow brick road. I'm a desperate lion today, stalking scarecrow. I chew by rows glimpse at my watch too often. I was so afraid of being late to see you once. I turned up six days early. Love is horrific like that. First it's a rabbit, then a duck, then it's a ravenous one-eyed sock puppet. But the rest is yoga adverts. And you fasten my thoughts with the most beautiful paper clips, even the filthy ones. Like the time I saw a grove of ripening chilli plants become a rainbow of penis trees. Do you wish to continue? Says the voice of a self-service checkout. Yes, yes I do. Between the shops, the sea snuggles under its blue leaves. The clock tower waits patiently for Christmas. A familiar figure below it, waggling his arms to lure me over succeeding. Your skillful face punches a giant hole in the day and I jump through it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry, just getting, getting to grips with the technicalities and uh, unmuting myself. A round of applause, everybody, please, I think, for, for both John and Sophia. We'll have to do it. Silent clapping. We can all be Marcel Marceau for a few seconds. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, right, I'm going to throw this part of the, the evening open to you uh, to ask your questions. I know that C Sharp wants to ask a question, uh, but can't type it because... They're on an iPad, so let me find them and unmute them. I think I have done. No, it's not working. Uh, okay. Um, Fire away. Am I, am I echoey? A little, yes. It's A little. Okay. Um, my question was for John. Um, after hearing and also being able to follow along in your book, uh, those last couple of poems, um, I, I didn't realize it the first time I read the book, but there's a lot of color that shows up, um, mostly of like the yellow, gold, orange variety. And I, I need to go back and look at all the other poems to see if that's like maybe a theme. 
but I guess that's my question. Is that a theme? Is is the are those bright colors, like the sunrise kind of colors within Reckless Paper Birds, is that on purpose? And if so, why? It, um, they just started creeping in. I think with this book, it's very different to my previous books, as many people have said. It's very um, manic and high energy as a collection. And one of the things, I think I sometimes, I'm quite synesthetic in that uh, for me, colors are often very rich in connotations. And for me, orange and yellow are very happy colors, which are very energetic, very bouncy, very kind of um, optimistic and positive. And a lot of the love poems in particular in the book have that sort of vibe. And um, I don't know. And also my favorite color has always been orange. I've always been, not just because of Lucas Aid, but like, um, yeah, I've always loved um, orange and yellow as colors. And um, they just um, they just chime with me, I suppose. So it wasn't that I deliberately plotted it out to be thematic, but then I think once I was became aware of it, definitely a lot of them engage with autumn, and so um, I, the, they're often in tension with something else. But um, yeah, yeah, they do run through the collection, and they definitely uh, it was something that I became aware of. And they um, they usually have very positive, manic, and slightly queer connotations for me. I, I have a question for both of you. Uh, triggered, I think, by, by Sophia's poem about uh, you can use this. Uh, you're both poets, you're both in relationships. Are there moments where you start writing a, a, a piece and that moment of guilt about actually I'm using my life and somebody else's life possibly without their consent, permission or knowledge? How does, how does that play out for you? Uh, personally, I've always found poetry a slightly safer space to do that because you can go into some really crazy places and <laughs> you can put some, you know, some interesting sort of multicolored curtains in front of yourselves and use metaphors. And so it's not just saying, you, you done me wrong, you took my joy or whatever it is. You, you don't have to be that Anglo-Saxon about it. I struggled with it more in my novel, which like a lot of first novels is semi-autobiographical and I was so horrified during that time so I literally just used to stop like dead in the street every time <laughs> I thought about people reading I would just halt um, and uh, I haven't had that with the poems um, I think with Helena um, who, who, I'm, who I'm married to um, there is a sort of sense of joy and sort of you know inspiration that, that comes very much into my second collection um but you know there is there are still people who i no longer see or no longer have relationships with and in my poetry i can kind of i can have conversations with them and i, I can bring them back to life and then put them away again it's the best of both worlds <laughs> john what, what's your what's your take on all of that i suppose for me a poem is to a degree always a construct of language so even though it might be inspired by someone specific who um, I'm not keen on <laughs> um, I'm, I suppose my get out would be that I've kind of transformed it and um, I would be cautious if I thought that it was very obviously about somebody and um, yeah I I too find it much easier when they've either died or are no longer in my life <laughs> And like, I just feel able to, um, but generally I think that even with those kinds of experiences that I tend to, there's usually a transformative element in the language in that on, in a poem, the voice only exists uh, for that poem. There's, you can never represent the full complexity of a human being um, within one poem. The voice exists for that space that it is speaking. And so, um, yeah, there's a necessity, I think that, as with songs too, like people often assume that any kind of song about a relationship, the songwriter must have been telling the literal truth about the relationship rather than just trying to write the best song they can to kind of move people and lift them and entertain them. And I think the same is true um, with most writers in that we just, most of us trying to write the best poem we can that's going to move people. And we draw on things that we know because those are emotionally resonant. But um, I have no interest in self-expression really or... Um, there might be a cathartic in the, in the first draft, but I'm generally more interested in the reader's experience than like getting something off my chest or like um, <laughs> laying into someone for a while. 
it's poetry, not revenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, life's too short. Life's too short. I mean, I do draw on, yeah, strong emotions from the past, but I don't know. There are a few people that I would really, yeah, want to pursue, <laughs> pursue in <laughs> my life. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Rodney. Uh, let me unmute him so he can ask. Hang on. Hello. 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 It's for both uh, Sophia and John. I, I was wondering how you managed to keep your your energy levels so high while you're reading at such a sort of distance on this Zoom thing, which is so weird. Mm. Yeah, it is. I was surprised when I first did a Zoom event that some of the adrenaline was still there. Um, it's, it's kind of become sort of muscle memory um, after a while that you have the, this thing to draw on. To be with a live audience is, is a wonderful thing. Um, but like, for example, here we can, you know, at least we can meet up internationally and people who might not be able to, to make it to, you know, your very inaccessible uh, venue in, in London, the kind of and can now come and interact and be part of that performance as well. So I hope that that's something we we continue with and maintain. Um, so yeah, the short answer is I found Zoom gigs different, but there's there's enough familiarity about them to to make them something that, that, that I still you know enjoy doing every now and then. Though I do have to remind myself that I've actually written stuff and uh, perform it in in the order that I roughly put the words, which, which feels odd when you're not doing it all the time. John. Um, with me, I've always just been slightly mindlessly positive. <laughs> I've been teaching feedback forms, the two words I've been teaching about 20 years now, and the two words I always get are energetic and enthusiastic. So I think it's just something that I'm, yeah, with me, that it's just perhaps to do with my personality and that I generally am easily excited <laughs> and easily <laughs> feel a sense of, um, yes, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. I suppose I'm quite optimistic generally. And, um, yeah, I get it. I, I mean, for me, it's a pleasure just to see the faces of people that I interact with mm. from, on Facebook as well. And I've not been doing very much social in the last um, nine months or so. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited to see you all and to um, interact and engage socially. So that helps with my energy. But oh, yeah, but also there is LucasAid. I'm not, I'm, they're not a sponsor, but like, yeah, <laughs> high <laughs> sugar levels. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any, any other questions? Yes, John. Hang on, let me uh, unmute you. Okay. Go. I'm unmuted. Great. Uh, superb presentations by both of you. Enjoyed them both tremendously. We're, we're in the middle still, or we're hopefully coming out, if we're hopeful, uh, of a pretty weird period when activities have been extremely constrained uh, and uh, in parallel, emotions and feelings have been fairly high. Uh, have the two of you found that with lockdown and all this coronavirus constraint, there's been more to write about or less to write about? I think when, when, when it first started, people were quite dismissive about like, oh God, the <coughs> pandemic poems are coming and they're all going to be awful. They're so bad. I can feel them in, in, in various parts of my body. It's going to be terrible. What I'd like to see is, you know, people approaching this in, you know, a more kind of depends on a futuristic way. We're say, imagine a world where this is the only way that anybody can interact with each other. You know, you wake up and you know, beam all your colleagues from in, from all over the world into into your kitchen. That seemed fairly mad a couple of a couple of months ago. Um, so I, I I I really look forward to seeing some good art. But at the same time, there have been you know there, there have been really good pieces of dystopian literature and creepy poetry and graphic novels that give you nightmares that predate the pandemic. I sometimes think if people are dealing with things like mortality and loss um, and uncertainty, uh, which we're dealing with on a grand scale, those themes that are universal, that they can come out at any time. And we already have quite a rich tradition to draw on. But yeah, two, two years from now, I am looking forward to seeing the rush of uh, pandemic novels. And, and some will be great and, and some will not. I suppose I think different moods, we, as readers, we all have different moods and require different texts at different points in our lives. And I think that there's space for both, I suppose, in that it's, 
a sequence of events which has imprinted us inevitably the same as um, other horrific sequences of events have and so there's going to be a natural um, desire not only to write about that to, but to read about that for some people but at the same time um, some people will want more of an escapist route and to read poems that aren't about the pandemic I think that it, those are equally valid and that as human beings we um, need access to a wide variety of literature a wide variety of poems from different perspectives um, so that you know one was really angry and we really need to, a political poem to be you know to cathartically express that we have that and then at other times if it's all become a bit too much and we want to retreat into something which is not about the pandemic and um, then yeah I think that we need those poems too so I think we need um, both. <laughs> yeah kind of follow-up question from from that um, not so much the the content of, of poetry as a result of, of what we're all living through uh, but uh, form and, and approaches to poetry. I'm, I'm reminded uh, a friend of mine in Northern Ireland, a poet called David Brazel, uh, who greatly enjoys all the, the kind of stand up and, and live poetry evenings that he's normally taking part in in Belfast, but he actually lives uh, several miles away and he now, now finds himself at home and he's experimenting with making short films and he's actually reading his own poems as voiceovers as a as a means of making poetry something that works on social media which is such a visual rather than an audio format uh, I just wonder what your thoughts on on how changing behaviors and, and, and changing ways of communicating might change the form of, of poetry as much as the content mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I really just got obsessed with radio and podcasts from sort of June onward. So um, I found myself in a bit of a bind with one author who, you know, like a lot of us had loads of their events cancelled. And, you know, there have been many debuts, debut novels or, you know, just novels that are launched during this time that all, all new poetry books that people have been real sports about. And it, they've just been so good and so humble and so well you know but better get on with it you know I would have been throwing my toys out of the pram but there you go <laughs> and this one also he'd been so lovely I thought sod I'm going to try and make a radio program with with nothing but a dictaphone and a, a computer and then I just became addicted to it so now I make a radio program every week and I speak to people around the world so one of my ways of doing that is to bring people together I've started doing bits of live um though in socially distanced venues um, and for, you know, as, long as, as long as that's possible, and then just basically taking the sound files and creating something out of them. I do really like spoken word films. I think they've sort of, um, they've really evolved over the past couple of years, though I did see a, a spoken word parody on, a spoken word film parody on TV a couple of years ago that was so funny, I was, I was actually sick. Um, having, having seen a few <laughs> versions of them, there was like, oh my God, that's so funny, I can't even laugh. Um, but you know, the good, one, the good ones are very, very good and uh, less about Sure. Yeah, I suppose my Pollyanna side of me wants to celebrate the new possibilities for poetry in this age where I think for me particularly having lots of friends who um, have some kind of impairment and um, or and or mobility issues, the um, the very the, the fact is that events like this are more accessible to lots of people who might not go to a conventional poetry reading. And there's also like a lack of a financial barrier this evening. This is a free event, yeah. and so um, in that sense, I suppose like it's um, some of the outcomes have not been entirely disagreeable to me in terms of increasing access to um, different kinds of um, listener and. Um, providing um, new kinds of interaction and engagement. I mean, whether it will affect the um, the form of poems um, long term, um, I don't know. But yeah, I've certainly been. Um, there is a side of me that yeah that welcomes um, greater awareness, perhaps, of uh, issues around um, ableism and people perhaps not being able to access. Um, poetry readings um, because of that and or um, financial reasons so yeah here I am again being um, Pollyanna-ish and trying to find the positives. <laughs> I think Caroline has a question. 
Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've got one for both of you. Although I, I know, John, you do put advice um, on your Twitter feed um, about keeping going as a poet. Um, and I was uh, wondering um, if you could say um, or come up with a piece of advice that somebody maybe gave you um, years ago that enabled you to keep going as a writer that you go back to. Or if there isn't such a thing, um, what would you have liked somebody to say, or what would you, what would you say um, to uh, you know an up-and-coming writer? Uh, interestingly, before tonight started, I was thinking about um, Roddy Lumsden, who was a great influence on on me and John. It's one of one of the things we have in common. He was one of one of my mentors and passed away in, in January of this year. Um, and because of the, the weirdness of everything that happened almost immediately afterwards, I still don't feel like I've actually got to mourn him properly because so much other stuff happened. John has a beautiful poem about him. And his, basically, I started out as a 100% performance poet, and Roddy is the person who taught me about half rhyme. So he's the reason why my poems don't all sound like the cats that are on the mat. Um, so, you know, that's, he's, he, he, with that one piece of advice, like, um, Sophia, half rhyme exists. Um, he has transformed pretty much everything I've produced since my early 20s. So yeah, how about you, John? What's your, what's your, what advice do you give? I suppose the biggest thing that I say to my students um, is that uh, I've got many irritating catchphrases <laughs> that get rolled out <laughs> endlessly. But one of them is that most problems are solved by reading. One of the problems I find with um, new poets is that they don't realize how important it is to read a really wide range of poets all the time and constantly be feeding into your brain uh, more and more um, voices more you know engaging more and more with what other people are doing because it just um, provides you with a real wealth of um, tools to fix the kinds of problems that emerge during the writing and editing of every poem. If you read lots of writers, you'll encounter lots of strategies, you'll encounter lots of ways of going about a poem, and it all kind of filters into your unconscious. And so when you are at the writing desk and you're presented with, you know, some of those really weird problems that are specific to individual poems, um, you know, you will just be, your brain will have recourse to all these different strategies for tackling those problems so if i just have one thing to say then yeah i suppose i would um i would say that okay. any more any more questions from from those present wave a wave a poor or type something in the chat no i think we may be done no oh okay in which case i think we should unmute everyone and we can all give John and Sophia the, the audible round of applause that they so very richly deserve. Thank you. Let me see if I can do it. Okay, we can do it for real. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's been an absolutely marvellous evening. You've both been brilliant. brilliant. Thank you so much from everybody at MKLit Fest. Thank you, everyone.